Sounds fuzzy still. Be still. Be still. Be still. Welcome to Conquering the Glass Ceiling, Episode 9, the show dedicated to inspiring women entrepreneurs to find their confidence and their worth and their value. Do you want to know how to negotiate your worth? Well, today we're going to talk to a female entrepreneur who has done just that. I'm your host, Dr. Courtney, and I believe when women are empowered to find their confidence and their worth and their value, we will truly achieve gender equality. Are you a female entrepreneur who is looking for motivation and inspiration to grow your business? Well, you have found the right spot. I've grown my business from just a small investment to a multi-million dollar enterprise, and I want to help you do the same. Conquering the Glass Ceiling will not only empower you, but every single week we will bring you insights and ideas from some of today's most inspiring and successful leaders who have been through your sh in your shoes and grown their, their in companies. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell and the, for the new video to be not notified. In a moment, we're gonna be joined by Carol Sankar, who is a thought leader, a keynote speaker, an author, and a close personal friend of mine who is working to close the gender gap. And she's the founder of the Confidence Factor for Women in Leadership. Carol is going to share with us the importance of negotiation, closing the value gap for women in leadership, and the importance of identifying our confidence. So stay tuned. <music> I am so excited to have Carol with us today. She is incredible and, and such a uniquely gifted person and the fact that she's one of the few female entrepreneurs that I know who stands firm in her confidence and her value and really gives back and helps inspire others to do the same. So Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to see your face. <laughs> I can't see you. I know, I know. Um, tell us really uh, quickly about how you got here and, and your journey. Um, so the, the quick version is I got here because um, in real estate, and you're probably going to hear a lot of background noise, which already started. Um, in real estate, there are very few women in this industry, in the building industry. 
And um, I didn't notice that at first until I became a mother. I think it was not until January 13, 2005, when I gave birth to the most important man in my life, my mm -hmm. son, Ryan, um, that I probably was not paying attention that there were no women in the room. And then after I had him, I started to wonder if this was normal and I, if I was accepting it because it was normal. And so I started really having questions with a lot of women who had been very in what we like to call non-gender normal um, professions. And that's how we started having these conversations about what's holding you back. And simply every conversation ended with it's confidence it's confidence it's confidence so that's where the confidence factor really started from it was just me wanting to know um partially if there were mothers in the room and then where are the women in the room and then where's the women's back bathroom and why are these jokes inappropriate now and why am i sensitive about people saying the wrong things to me so it, it was it's really started from the moment i had my son uh-huh and from those conversations with those women what were your next steps? My next step was trying to figure out if I wanted to even touch the topic because, you know, when it comes to women touching very soft topics, meaning they're, they're hot button issues, um, there tends to be some pushback and there tends to be a little bit of apprehension, not only from women, but from men, because sometimes what we do is when we become uh, we become immune to it, we become adjusted to the conversation. So, you know, if there are no women in construction, we just say, okay, there's just no women in construction. If there are no women in the, the, the boardroom, we just say there are no women in the boardroom and we continue that narrative. So for me, it was about wanting to know if I was ready for this conversation. And then the second thing was, now that I'm going to get in the conversation, how do I get other women to see that they're not in the right rooms? How do I get women to see that they're right next to the door, but they're not going through the door? So how do I get more women to understand that there's more room at the top? And having that conversation, I had to build it into a real platform which took some time, but after a while I realized that there was value for us having a conversation about confidence and about leadership in a different way that was going to be, I was going to give women accountability on their, um, the, the, their responsibility in this conversation. I was not going to make it that is all men's fault. Some of it is our fault and I was going to make sure that you understood what part we played in this narrative. Absolutely. And so why is confidence such an important topic for women leaders? I think it's an important topic because it's something we don't like to talk about. You see, women suffer in silence and we don't like to talk about the fact that we suffer in silence. If we, I have fear, as long as I dress it up every day and put on a ton of foundation and lipstick, nobody's going to know, right? Nobody right. has any idea that I'm just as fearful. I've been sitting at the same desk for 20 years. I don't want to ask for a raise. I don't want to raise my hand. I don't want to contribute more because I'm afraid of rejection, but I look good doing it. And so I think what we do, we have a way of hiding our somewhat our professional indiscretions behind ensuring that we look a certain way. So we look confident. So the, the portrayal of confidence is the thing that, I, that gets me on my nerves the most is because we can look good fearful. You can look very good. You know, they fix your face up very good at Macy's these days. And so <laughs> you can go to any makeup artist and it will do you over, but you, you don't have what's inside. And so mm -hmm. replenishing that those lost commodities inside called confidence is really important so that when everyone looks at you outside and thinks that you believe in yourself, what's inside is, do I believe in what I'm telling myself? And so that's why we have to to continue to have this conversation about confidence and the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. So how does your company support building confidence in women? We do a lot of stuff, a lot of, <laughs> lot of interesting stuff. So we write books and policy pieces and articles. I get out there and speak and leave my family for days at a time and yes, you do. Um, go on stages and do media appearances. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I didn't think it was a company in the beginning because real estate is my company. So I thought it wasn't a real company in the beginning. And the more that people started to say, I didn't think of confidence like that. I thought if I wore the suit, if I looked the part, I was confident, not realizing that I was not addressing some internal issues or I wasn't asking for enough money or I wasn't asking for more um, 
more leadership opportunities. I wasn't raising my hand. Uh, and that helped me to be able to see that there was a need in other corporations to do this. So we do corporate corporate trainings for other corporations that may not have any women on their boards. That's particularly where I'm staying right now as I'm parking my expertise on in major corporations that are void of women. Right now, we only have 12 corporations that have women on their board. And so we gotta change that. And you know, consistently changing the narrative and walking into major um, rooms that are what I like to call totally void of women and telling men, you have some very talented women around here, but they're afraid of you. You, know, you just don't know that they're afraid of you. They're not afraid of you because they're afraid you're gonna beat them, but they're afraid that if they ask you something, that might be out of the norm that you won't support their growth. And so I try to make sure that I, I neutralize that conversation. So that's how we support people around here. I love it. And you know, it's very incredible to me in my research to find that less than 6% of um, S&P 500 CEOs are female. Yeah. And, and that, it, how do we have a man on the moon and <laughs> have this conversation? I mean, it's just, those it just blows me away and if mm -hmm. so how do you how do you broach that subject with a, a room full of men um and 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 do it in a collaborative manner that you can say it's i'm not there's no blame but let's mm -hmm. open this door for others uh, other women to come through well here's the thing what i've been noticing over the years um going into certain corporate boardrooms to have this conversation. Men are not opposed to having women on boards. Mm -hmm. They're just opposed to having fearful women on board, mm -hmm. women who can't make decisions and won't step up. So if they don't know that they're qualified women that are up to the task, they don't really appoint from within. That's the first problem. The second problem is we have a qualification bias. That's a totally different conversation, but we have a qualification bias, which is basically this. If there are board seats available and a woman says that there are 25 things on this checklist that a board member is, should have in order for them to be considered, if we have 24, we're not going to apply. Mm -hmm. Where men could have 10 of those qualities and they're still going to apply. So that qualification bias is really a huge hindrance. It's a self bias of us not believing that if we don't have all 25 qualifications for a board seat, we're just not going to go up for the election process because what's the sense in getting rejected, right? What, why do I want to go put my stuff on the line and get rejected only to hear that you're not qualified? So we self-assess and then we don't apply because we say that they asked for 25 things on a bullet list because everybody else has these 25 things. And if we don't feel like we have all 25, we just don't go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also have the normative bias where men are used to sitting with other men. It's, and then they appoint from their friends within the board. So if there are 10 men on a board, they ask one of the men that's sitting there, hey, John, do you know anyone else who can fill in a board seat? And then John says, yeah, I know Matt. Because he's probably... You know, he that's true. I mean, it's he knows Matt. He mm -hmm. doesn't know Jennifer. He knows Matt. So mm -hmm. he chooses Matt and it continues on the, in that normative bias. So on one hand, men are not opposed to having us, but we have to be we have to stop worrying about perfection mm -hmm. and stop focusing on that element because I have t I can tell you tons of times where I end up at a work at the confidence back with three of the five skills that I'm asking for and they still apply um, where women just won't apply with all, without all five. They just will not apply at all. So if we're, we're not losing talent, we just have a qualification bias in the way we view our talent. And if we don't fix that, then we can't fix the confidence gap as well. Is that why you believe there's still a value disparity? Huge. Mm -hmm. That's the exact reason I believe there's a value disparity because what we do is we have conversations with ourselves. We don't have conversations with each other. We have conversations with ourselves and we measure up to someone else. So if, for example, if Kim Kardashian went to the White House yesterday, we just don't think we're as important as Kim Kardashian, not thinking maybe what we should do is write the White House and say what we have to offer. We just automatically assume, oh, well, she's popular. She's, so what we do is we already started this assessment gap, so we don't value ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. And then we stay around other people who continue to help us to believe in that same qualification gap because that other person is saying, yeah, you're right. You're just not as popular as her. You're never going to get ahead. Uh -huh. And so that value gap continues to 
not allow us to think of ourselves as saying, if we have 24 out of 25 bullet points on a qualification list, apply. Mm -hmm. There is a huge possibility that the 25th thing that you're looking at may not be as important as all the other 24. You have the majority. We just talk ourselves out of things a lot differently. And as a result, we just don't have women in hyper-masculine industries. And then we call it that men just don't see us. No, they, they, they don't see us. It's we haven't applied. We mm -hmm. haven't we haven't gotten in the room. And until we get more women in the room, that value gap is always going to be a, a huge issue. So how can we change the way women ask for money and negotiate? Okay. So here's here's our research and here's what I believe. Women have to stop looking at money as money. We have to start looking at it as a bargaining tool. Mm -hmm. And we have to start looking at it as not being greedy. You see, we, here's where women and men really have a huge disparity in money. Men look at it as a way to feed their family. Women look at it as a way to feed my family, but if I don't get it, I'll clip a coupon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, Dr. Courtney, mm -hmm. but I just don't believe in a discounted life. I just go full out. Whatever, if, if it's not on sale and I need it, like if it's coffee, there's no such thing as me driving 85 gazillion miles to get a 99 cent cup of coffee. If it's $5 and that's what I've got, that's what I have to do. My time um, is more valuable than saving 25 my cents. Time, thank you. My <laughs> time is more valuable and I live out in the country. My time is more valuable than for me to, to think mentally that I saved money by getting a 99 cent cup of coffee. What we have to do is we have to stop thinking about the principle of money and the fact that if I ask for more, I look that up. I look like I'm desperate. I look like I am eager. I look like it, it, we start worrying about all the other words that we can assess on ourselves. And I don't get into some of those disrespectful words, but, but we, we worry about what people think if we ask for money. Mm -hmm. So first thing is we have to not look at money as money. It has to be a bargaining tool. For my value that I give you for eight hours a day, or 10 hours or 12 hours a day, I deserve blank. That's your bargaining tool. You deserve it because you should not be shopping according to a discounted system because you believe that, okay, well, I don't want to look desperate, so I'm going to drive five more miles to get 99 cents worth of coffee. Instead of thinking, if my time is at $125 an hour, then I should not have to do this, right? So we have to look at it as a bargaining tool. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is too, we also have to look at asking for money as a right. Because I have seen where I've gone into negotiation expert interviews and, and men look at it as a right. We look at it as an option. It's not an option, it's a right. Like if I'm trading in my presence every single day, there's a remuneration for it. I'm expecting some type of remittance for it. My staff doesn't like to work for free, and I really don't think that they should, right? Right. If they don't come to work, I don't get to do the things that I do. If somebody doesn't check my, my calendar, it's unfair of me to ask her to volunteer. That's not mm -hmm. what their job is. And so for them to come in and ask for more money, I'm looking at it as, you know, you help me make more money. So yeah, you, you really do deserve more money. So we have to look at the bargaining aspect. It's not money. It is what do I get for your presence? Is it a value to the company? And how do I describe it to the company as a value to the company? And if you're in business, it's the same thing. What is your value to your clients? What's the value to your customer? Are you fixing something that they can't fix on their own? And what's the value for your presence toward your, your clients and your customers and your buyers? All of those things we have to think about. It is not about being greedy. Mm -hmm. It is about getting what you deserve and financial remuneration. I don't see it as a problem. I think it's a very huge benefit and we need more women to not look at money as a really, really disgraceful and greedy thing. It's not, I just, I, I don't like driving that long. I got an eight cylinder car and gas is up to $3 and change a gallon. I don't, um, I don't want to start if I don't have to. <laughs> Well, right. Well, and, and do you see there's a, a couple different things that I'm thinking. So first of all, it's women need to first find confidence in themselves to mm -hmm. believe that they are valuable. Um, yeah. And and is that what what you're finding in your research that that that's where that conversation is going to start? Not only just the confidence, that's part of it, but mm -hmm. also the not talking yourself out of it aspect, the you know, I don't want to come across as, I don't want to ask for a raise because, you know, he deserves it more than I do. Or, you know, remember I took that day off on Christmas day and maybe that wasn't right. You know, <laughs> things like that. 
Um, mm. We have to give women the ability to believe in themselves such that if we want to close the pay gap, if we want to close the value gap, if we want to close all these gaps that we have, we've got a ton of different gaps. If we want to close all these gaps, the best way to close it is financially. Mm. And because then now we've gotten to a point where we've discussed everything that we 79 cents, 70, like I'm tired of seeing these reports. One day, one day we've got to stop looking at the research and we've got to do the work. And the only work I believe that is necessary to do is to negotiate. If we give more women the tools and the resources and the confidence to be able, like I said, stop dressing it up and start working on the inner parameter of seeing that we're valuable enough to ask for money, then we don't have to walk into an negotiation meeting, feeling intimidated and willing to settle fast. I tell everyone, my posture is very arrogant. You don't have to like it, but it's okay. I go into a ton of negotiation meetings sitting sideways. It's, it's imperative that I do that. It's my way of letting you know that I will walk. I, don't, I have no intention of being disrespected. I, I've come up to a number, you've come to a number, we keep going back and forth and you're still stuck. I walk. Mm -hmm. I do that even right now. I'm looking for a house to, to buy from myself, you know, I'm, my son is going to a new school next year. I've walked away from tons of, you know, 368, 360. I'm not doing it. I, I walk, mm -hmm. you know, because I believe that my value is more um, important than just sitting around and settling. So you have to know that that it's not just about the confidence. It's what you bring to the table. It's your value. Right. And, and your time is worth something. And one of the things I see as a speaker is that so many, and I don't know about male speakers, but female speakers are expected to speak for free. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and, and it's, it's, to the point where I get frustrated with other women who who agree to do that at the expense of selling a ten dollar book, and and I'm thinking, don't you value your time and your your self worth more than um, to just give your knowledge? You're you're a subject matter expert, and you're just giving that away instead of doing um, negotiating your worth. You're giving yourself away. If there was a way I can scream and like like have a tambourine and like you and I can have like a cry moment, <laughs> I would do that. I want to do that so badly, yes. but I can't. Yes. So, uh, you're, you're completely right. And I think that when it comes to women speakers, it is not... Okay, so what destroys it for the women speakers who are have barriers? The, the problem, especially in the corporate market, what, what the barrier really has become is that women speakers Speakers, yes, they are expected to volunteer, but they have been volunteering. Right. So if we change the narrative of those who will volunteer, then the ones who don't volunteer don't have to negotiate. It, 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 it's, it's like a gift and a curse. If someone else is willing to do it for free, they're going to expect that you do it for free. Mm -hmm. I always say to a lot of events, conversation when you contact me versus when I contact you. If I contact mm -hmm. you and I have to volunteer, it's because I made the first move, right? It's like dating. If I made the first phone call, that's your story, right? Like my husband always, when he tells the story about how we met, he always says, she called me first, right? But you gave me your beeper number first. So, you know, it's always who did what first. Uh -huh. But when it comes to speaking, if someone contacts you first, they saw value. If you choose to give that conversation away for free, it's because you don't see value in yourself. Event coordinators and managers, this might be controversial to say, but it is what it is. I think they like to hire women speakers because they like to save on a good budget. It is the truth. Because more of us, if they have all women panels at an all women event, if the budget is a half a million dollars, they're going to save more than half of that because speakers are not asking for money. They're more concerned with getting there to have a picture on the step and repeat, a picture in front of the lectern and in front of a microphone. Mm -hmm. If we were to, as a force of women, as a force of the ability to be able to say, we are subject matter experts, we are leaders, we are thought leaders, we are experts in our field. And, you know, those of you who want to volunteer because you are in the kindness, out of the kindness of your heart, that's fine. You stay over there. And the rest of us are going to, um, we're going to negotiate for our value. I think it will be much different because men don't negotiate. Nobody goes up to Tony Robbins and says, Hey, Tony, I want you to speak at the Leadership Summit tomorrow. Um, so we were th thinking you should volunteer because we're, our budget is really, really small. Like, nobody does that. Right. Someone always says we've got 
$4 million can Tony Robbins come out? Same thing with Gary Vee. Everybody knows that he charges $750,000 for a keynote talk. Nobody goes to Gary Vee and says, you know, Gary, out of the kindness of your heart, I was just thinking, because we're small nonprofit, mm -hmm. and like I said, they like to save money so they get more women on stage. And if we were as a collective to, to agree that this is not the norm, I think that the speaking industry will change. But until then, we have to get other women speakers and other thought leaders to believe in themselves such that they ask for money. Even if it's a hundred bucks, just get into the habit of saying, I don't deserve to leave my house unless I get a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. you, once you get into the formation of asking for money, then you ask for more and you'll ask for more. And that puts the barrier out toward people having access to your expertise. Well, let's have that conversation about how some tips on how women can negotiate for their worth, because I know you know them. Well, the first thing is you have to know you're worth it. Mm -hmm. So tip number one, are you worth it? Do you believe that you're worth it? I say write a list down of things that you do that are brilliant, that only you know that you can contribute to that are brilliant, that you believe have value and assess a dollar amount to it. It doesn't have to be a permanent dollar amount. It just has to be something you are used to saying. And then Number add a hundred dollars. Even if it's a hundred bucks, even if it's $10, mm -hmm. money is always a barrier. And it's a, a great way for people to see that you have an idea that you're valuable. Not that you know your value yet, but you are valuable. So that's how you start the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing is that we have to be ready to say no. So if you negotiate well, you have to know at some point negotiations break down. So when you say no, that means point B in that is that you can't take things personally. Yes. So, so you have to be willing to walk away with, uh, you know, what we in, in law, we call it clean hands. It's done. It's all, I have nothing to do with that. You got to let it go. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you have to not take things personally, because if you have your eggs in one basket and that basket breaks, you're going to take it personally. If you have your eggs in 55 different baskets and one breaks, you are not as disappointed. So you have to be okay with saying no. I will tell you that people have this idea that I'm busy and I'm flying them to the other, but nobody knows. I say no more often than I say yes. If I get 85 requests a day, I probably say no to 84 of them because 84 of them don't make sense for my lifestyle and for what I think my expertise is worth. And I don't go back to saying, you know, I should have because it's good for publicity mm -hmm. and, you know, I can possibly use that as, like, I don't do that. Like, it's, it's, I said no, it's no. And I walk away and whatever. If it comes back to me, fine. If it doesn't come back to me, I said no. And I meant it and I'm no longer personally invested. And I think the last thing that women really have to really keep in mind once you start getting in a habit of knowing that you're getting closer to knowing your value, it is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. It's a non-negotiable aspect. So me saying no to a lot of things is a non-negotiable. I always say, and this is, a, this is kind of a joke, but it's not funny. If you want me to put my real clothes on with my real foundation and my real makeup, it's going to cost you something. <laughs> I would rather say no and be in my pajamas in my bed with the blinds closed and my earphones in my ear snoring <laughs> than, I, and, <laughs> than coming and doing something that is not worth the effort. Right. And so it's, it has to be a non-negotiable decision. Mm -hmm. So no one can come back and say, well, Carol, can you, can you do this? Like, I'll even share with you something that happened the other day. A company wanted me to come to their organization volunteer my time mm -hmm. and they kept claiming that oh but you can uh you know uh well you'll it's a great networking opportunity you're going to get a chance to meet four thousand eight hundred and some odd ceos and this that the other and i said no and so when i said no i really went back to bed like no <laughs> go back to bed mm -hmm. they come back like two days later oh wait wait carol i think you like this Okay, okay, what about if we have like a news camera there and the news camera says that you're there? I said, no, go back to bed, put my socks back on, go back to bed. And they kept trying to make it such that they were sweet in the deal. My no was non-negotiable. Yeah. It was not negotiable. It was a no from a deep space of I didn't see value and you didn't see the value in me either. It is non negotiable mm -hmm. so they were just shocked that I, no matter how many times they try to sweep in the deal it was just that i kept saying no and i would rather be in my bed right it's more valuable to be in my bed because i'm on a construction site as i speak 
to you. I'd rather be in my bed mm -hmm. than to be, you know, volunteering to seat the 4,300 people that I don't even know if are in my target market. So what am I doing? So right. saying no and making it non-negotiable. They thought that I, I was going to negotiate because you make it sweet and you put a camera in my face. It's non-negotiable. I'm good. I'm right. going to stay home. Yeah. Go back. So how can we change the way the workplace pays women? We have to have conversations with stakeholders in the workplace, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, many of the stakeholders in the workplace know that there's a pay disparity and they know why there's a pay disparity, whether it is the motherhood penalty, whether it is the um, in, in child care policy penalty, whether it was because that woman took some family leave to take care of her ailing mother, they know why. Mm -hmm. But we're not having conversations with them because we found ways to accept it. So in order for us to change that part of the narrative about what's going on in the workplace, we've got to talk to the stakeholders who made that decision. The second thing is we we have to give him the chance any longer. I don't know when becoming a, a mother was like this whole, it was a disrespectful thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I never saw a man give, give birth. And so, um, you know, this is the only civilized nation that can tell you, okay, you gotta be back to work in six weeks and you've gotta be back to work at full speed. Like we have to, we have to be very mindful of what we, we are doing as far as teaching women that when, when they come back to the workplace after six weeks, that they don't still feel as valuable right. um and we have to have conversations with women about that mm -hmm. and i think one of the other things that we're not doing a great job of we're not educating women from a place of power early on i think we have to get these younger women the millennials the ones who are com coming out of university we have to get them early because what i didn't know in when i was coming when i was graduating as an undergrad i was highly ambitious i saw myself i was going to make eight million dollars from the day I graduate. I am the best. What I didn't know is I didn't, I had the right to ask for money. Um, when I discovered from myself that I had to start asking for money was I graduated from university. I remember it was December 22nd, 2002. My grandmother had just passed away. My mother had put the house on the market because she had already moved. And I was, I was the only one that said I didn't want to live, live there. And I found out what the cost of real rent was because I never paid it <laughs> before. <laughs> Changed and your mind. This is New York City. So let me make sure you understand. I live in North Carolina now, but this was New York City. Mm -hmm. New York City has never been cheap. And so making $24,000 that I had never negotiated before and I just took it in my grandmother's house, was, it went a long, long way because I have no bills to pay. You know, my grandmother wouldn't take a dime from me. Mm -hmm. She passes. And I go out to find out what the cost of an apartment was like, oh, 500 bucks, 500 a day. Like, uh, yeah, <sighs> a half a bedroom was 1500 bucks. And that was not even in the best neighborhood. So I'm like, oh, my God, I can't afford it because I didn't negotiate for anything. Mm -hmm. So it became a real shock to me how bad I was living because the falsehood of living in a, in a bedroom at 21 is one thing. The other narrative is now I have to get out in the real world, and this is a totally different um, arena for me, and I have to I have to be adjusted to this. So I think what we have to do is we have to get women in college. I think we're not doing a great job of that because we are we are raising ambitious girls and ambitious women who get out in the workplace and get the shock of their life, a sticker shock, mm -hmm. and they accept that sticker shock for too long. And there's a Wall Street Journal report that basically says that the gen Gender gap in the workplace starts at 32. That's because by the age of 32, you've probably accepted the lowest end of your pay. And by 32, you have met the man of your dreams. You want to settle down. You want a white picket fence and you want a kid. Mm -hmm. Try having all four of them between 32 and 40 and seeing exactly in that eight years what happens to your pay. So we have to educate women by 21 to get ready for 32 mm -hmm. instead of them finding out at 32 when they finally found that they want to have 2.6 kids and what that's going to look like if they don't work for eight years, what that whole narrative is going to look like until they're 40. Mm -hmm. Gosh, you are such a wealth of information. I love talking to you. And I, I hate that our time is almost over. But Carol, just if our audience wants to get in touch with you and wants to know more about the confidence factor for women in leadership, because everything you're saying is spot on. I just 
applaud, applaud, <laughs> applaud, because this is this is exactly what I talk about as well. Um, how can mm -hmm. our audience get in touch with you? Everything is at theconfidencefactorforwomen.com. So you can go to www.theconfidencefactorforwomen.com or carolsankar.com. That's all one word, C-A-R-O-L-S-A-N-K-A-R.com. And I'm on Twitter 25 hours, eight days a week, every day. <laughs> Are you a tweeter? I am not a oh Twitterer. I got the Twitter fingers so badly. It's like I got to tweet like every hour on the hour. I got to say something on my Twitter page. Oh, my God. Well, you have given us so many valuable Twitter nuggets. So I, I would love to. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to get back on Twitter and I'm going to push them out because you have given us so much information. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. And, and I am I'm just I'm your biggest fan. So. I'm your biggest fan too, Dr. Baker. I'm honored. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I will talk to you soon. Same here. Hey, guys, I'm here with Larissa, and we are at Kids Care Therapy. <laughs> I kind of have an end here. So, um, <laughs> Larissa, tell me the best characteristic of your favorite boss. Sure. Okay. I think my the best characteristic of my favorite boss has to be um, giving me a lot of freedom and letting me work at my own pace, which is usually a little bit fast and frantic. <laughs> and, True. Yeah. And allowing me space to just do what I need to do. So, very, well, very hands off. <laughs> Very hands yeah. off. Good to know. Yes, but always can, there. Yes, always yeah. there. Well, great. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Back to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, hands off leadership, what does that look like? It really allows her to work at her own pace, which equates to not micromanaging. And that only becomes available when you trust the people that you are um, leading. So our prescription to lead today is where do you need to put your trust in the people that you lead? Or if you value hands-off leadership, but you're being micromanaged, where or when are you gonna have the conversation to ask what you need to do to gain that trust in the people that you are working with? So now we know Carol's advice for how to negotiate your worth and my worth. And if you want your free guide to conquering the glass ceiling, your glass ceiling, then head on over to CourtneyBaker.com and get your free guide to conquering the glass ceiling. And if you like today's video, please rate, review, and subscribe to the channel and comment below and tell me how you're conquering your glass ceiling. We'll see you next week.